executive event, he helped, helped us secure a room uh, so that we can have Ishtar Saab's uh, talk, talk here. Um, and of course, thank you to all of you to come here. So we really look forward to hearing from you, Ishtar Saab, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yaku, for this. And this very learned audience here does me a lot of honor by coming today to listen to my presentation uh, on the partition, where, of course, Mohammed Ali Jena, I have discovered, is a very central figure. And, and uh, so that's what we are going to talk about. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that in the Punjab book, one of the interviews which I did was with a culprit who led the attack on the Sikh uh, temple about 200 meters away from where I was born and grew up. It's called the Chemi Barshai. Mm -hmm. And uh, the confession made by this man Mujahid uh, Tajdin tells us how this whole conspiracy was hatched and the SHO of the Lahore Muzang uh, police station he brought the local gundas uh, taught them how to attack and, and so on and uh, so on the 13th of August I think this attack took place and the Sikhs uh, who were inside had come actually from all the northern parts of uh, West Pakistan and, and Punjab and so on. And they were waiting there for an opportunity to cross the border into India because already the Punjab was on fire, the partition had been declared and, and so it was like the Hobbesian state of nature everybody attacking everybody else in order to survive themselves. So I'm so glad his mother confirmed this story because one of the things which some of the detractors of their research was that how can we trust oral histories? Mm. Maybe he sat at home and imagined all these things. But when his mother confirmed that the same man, I think many of you, they shut up, those people also knew uh, Yakub Bangesh. So, my initiation into the partition begins at my childhood. Uh, a day earlier, this is the 4th, 13th of August, on the 12th of August, my mother, we lived on Temple Road, Lahore, which is one of the central uh, roads in the Lahore built by the British. And at about 10 in the morning, she just happened to look from the window on the road what was going on. The hall was burning at that time. And, and she noticed that the local roughnecks, you know, were collected on the right side of the... She stood in the window and some trouble was on the way because the, the worst type of characters were there. And the hall was burning at that time. So from... Her left, first came a Sikh gentleman, big, strong, on a motorbike. And when he came close to where these guys were standing, they tried to attack him. So he pulled out a gun and fired in the air, and they all dispersed. So he could pass safe, safely. Then, about 20 minutes later, I mean, a woman's instinct that there, there is going to be something terrible going to happen here. She kept on looking from the window down into the road. A sick carpenter came on uh, a bike with his daily food attached to the handle. You know, it's called portly in Punjabi. Mm -hmm. The poor man had no idea that there is a partition taking place and people will be forced out of their homes, they'll have to flee for their lives. So when he approached these characters, they pounced upon him and killed him mercilessly. My mother died in February 1990, and I remember that all along in these years, she would have a trauma and she would say that this incident which she has seen was was 
debasement of humanity. Mm -hmm. She just couldn't overcome that an old man, and that also a very poor old man who maybe all his life had served them, you know, in some small, uh, you know, uh, he was a carpenter, and still he was killed without any mercy. So I grew up hating the partition and wanting to know what has happened. And then in my formative years, I, I uh, read Manto, Krishan Chandra, Rajinder Singh, Pedi, Bal, uh, Balwan Singh, you name anyone, and uh, Ashfaq Ahmed, you know, later on a right-wing writer, Ahmed Nadeem Qasmi, mm -hmm. even Kudratullah Shahab, mm -hmm. once again a very right-wing uh, right man. Their best works in fiction are on the partition. Mm -hmm. Because partition was a tragedy which made people register their horror at how human beings had treated other human beings, simply because they had a very different religion. So my interest in understanding the partition begins from there. Then when I looked around, what sort of material was available? Uh, those in the UK were just writing reports of the governors of Punjab, you know, they were fortnightly reports. Mm -hmm. uh, or of the of the sec, uh, of the chief secretaries posted in the Punjab, what they had been saying. So that was a useful source of understanding how the British were registering the events. But the tragedy was, or the problem was, that all this ended on the 14th of August. On the 15th, power was transferred to the Indian and Pakistani administrations on both sides. And what they have recorded, if they have recorded, is still classified. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what uh, reports are available. In 1997, there were Indian feminists, uh, Ritu Menon, Kamala Basin, and uh, Urvashi Batalia. They wrote on the partition and they went to some women Hindu Sikh women who had been devastated by the partition, but according to Orthodox Hinduism and Sikhism, women who had been in the custody of Muslims were unclean. So many of them ended up as spinsters, living in these houses outside Delhi. So they talked to them and t told their horrific stories from Rahul Pindi, where one of the worst massacres of the partition took place. So there were these two sources, and then the Punjabi, the, the fictional literature mm -hmm. on Punjab. And then there was, I was then at, at uh, Stockholm University, and uh, the, the ethnic conflict, the ethnic cleansing, the genocides took place in front of our eyes in uh, Yugoslavia, which broke down. So many of these influences on me kept on urging me. You know, there is a there is a short story by Krishna Chandra, Kalu Bhangi, mm -hmm. and I think it's a classic. Mm -hmm. If someone were to ask me which is one of the greatest short stories written uh, in the Urdu language, I would say this is one. And Krishna Chandra says that there was this man who used to work in the hospital where his father was a doctor and his duties were to clean all that was mm -hmm. unclean there and everybody abused him and mistreated him. But he says that every time his eyes met with this man, he seemed to tell him, why don't you tell my story? I have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. But Krishna Chandra says that, what was the story? that everybody abused him. He didn't have a mother, he didn't have a wife, he didn't have children. He was simply an object to be uh, uh, insulted all the time. What is the story? How can I write a story about this? And then one day, he says, I noticed that he was taking 
the cows and the and the buffaloes. You know, people at that time used to keep these things at home, and even the goats and so on, out for uh, grazing. Uh, he was leading them, and Krishna Chandra says, "I followed this man." And then I saw that when they were out in the field, he was lying down, and one of the cows was with with her tongue, you know, touching his body. And you know, among Hindus, the cow is holy. Mm -hmm. So the story is that a man who is a Dalit, who is despised for whatever his wrong birth is, uh, is loved by a goddess of the Hindus. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. So that sort of thing also spoke to me. That I had to go and find out what happened actually to the people of Punjab. So that's the origin of my book on Punjab. And I would still say that this book probably has brought me more fame and so on for the obvious reasons that this is Jinnah, who is uh, a saint according to the Pakistanis and the arch villain according to maybe some people in India. But what, what was his role? I mean, I had to find out what had he done. So, from the partition of Punjab, then I had the Pakistan garrison state uh, that I wanted to uh, find out why a state like two states were founded on the same day. One went on to become a democracy, had a proper constitution, and even reservations for the di most despised sections of uh, Indian society. And with Pakistan claiming to be Islamic and all that, ended up by dictatorship and military rule and so on. So, somewhere there was something wrong with the whole idea of dividing people on the basis of religion. And the literature on Jinnah, the famously Stanley Walcott, mm -hmm. uh, the ultimate uh, tribute to uh, Jinnah is that you know, leaders have changed history. He has changed history and geography. You know, those who have read this book know that this is the ultimate uh, uh, compliment that you can give Jena. And then we have all those arguments of Wali Khan and others that he was simply a British agent. Huh? Mm -hmm. So then I had to look at Jena and there was this very influential theory that Jena didn't want partition. It was imposed on him by Congress and, and especially Nehru. So the story, what was the truth, I had to find out. And being a political scientist, for me, the power of the word is very important. You know. As you go along mm -hmm. in political theory, you read Plato, you read Aristotle, you read Marx, you read their texts. What have they been so, uh, saying? and how they have impacted on history and society and so on. So I started looking at Jinnah and his career uh, from 1906 onwards. And very hurriedly we would say that it is true that Jinnah began as a Indian nationalist, committed to a united India where all Indians, irrespective of their religion and so on, would be equal citizens. Uh, and the high point of his politics during this stage was the Lucknow Pact. And the Lucknow Pact, uh, in fact, won for the Muslims a very generous package uh, in the Muslim minority provinces. In Maharashtra, uh, Gujarat, you name any. Hindu majority province and the actual percentage of the Muslim population, whatever it was, they got double the seats. And then I have argued that you must look at the Congress which was generous enough to agree to it. If they had not agreed, they not could not have won these uh, uh, you know, over-representation for Muslims. And in the Central Assembly, 33% of representation was granted to Muslims, 
when in nine, when at the turn of the 20th century, Muslims are only 24.9% uh, uh, of the total population of India. So that is the high point of Jinnah. How, how does Jinnah then turn into a Muslim nationalist demanding the partition of India? And it's a very long story. And uh, I would strongly urge you to read the book to find out what uh, compelled him, forced him to take these positions diametrically opposite to his original position. And my argument is that Mr. Jinnah, definitely we have to grant, was a born leader. He had all those leadership qualities which made people follow him. So he had the charisma. But he also had a problem, psychological problem, that he would not brook second fiddle position. He always wanted to be leader number one. And in 1916, when the Lucknow Pact was agreed between Hindus, Muslims, if you want to call it, or more correctly, between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, everybody celebrated him as the ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity. So that was the high point. But there are certain personal exchanges between Mahatma Gandhi and, and Jinnah, which I think explain his psychological state uh, for demanding Pakistan. Uh, and one was that in 1915, when uh, Gandhiji returned from South Africa, there was a public reception arranged by the Gujarati speaking people, where uh, the welcome address was delivered by Jinnasan, in which he was very warm, very appreciative of what Gandhiji had done for the Indians in South Africa. When Gandhi gets up, he says, I'm delighted to see a Mohammedan leader also on the same platform as all others. According to Stanley Walcott, Jinnah took very, uh, I mean, he felt insulted because he thought he was an Indian leader on the station of the leader of all Indians. And Gandhiji was diminishing his status to a Mohammedan leader. I think there is a point that uh, Paul Pot makes because it explains how Jinnah then drifts away and finally becomes an inveterate, mm. unforgiving enemy of Gandhi. That's a personal hatred that he developed, which was pathological. So how do we explain then the politics in between which takes him towards the Pakistan demand? And I think uh, 1917 maybe hurriedly I can mention, there was a, a session of the Indian National Congress where Jinnah started speaking in English. And uh, the followers of Gandhi said, Speak in Gujarati, you are a Gujarati, you are a Gujarati. He minded that. But more importantly, uh, in 1919, started the problem with the Khilafat movement. And it, we should put it on record. It's the Muslims who came to Gandhiji and not the other way around. You know, the Hindu right these days damns Gandhi for you know, adopting Khilafat movement, but they don't explain that what was Gandhiji trying to do. After 1909, the Muslims of India had been effectively separated from the rest of the Indian population by being granted separate electorates mm -hmm. and weightage. It was the result of the 1906 Shimla deputation led by uh, the Aga Khan and, and Muslim notables from all over India saying that we are an important community and in a general election the Muslims are at a disadvantage so we need to have separate electorates where Muslims vote only for Muslims and we need additional weightage because we are an important community in the armed forces and in the police and so on uh, which was granted in 1909. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so with this thing in the background, then now the Muslims come uh, to Gandhiji. I think Gandhiji in good faith 
agreed to leave this movement and the movement was that uh, what the Khilafat movement wanted was actually what the British had in a vague sense promised uh, Indian Muslims that after the war we will not take away the holy lands of the Muslims from the Ottomans because the Ottomans were the last symbol of Muslim power. All other empires, rulers had been defeated, North Africa, Malaysia, Indonesia, everywhere Western colonial powers were ruling and of course in India. So the sympathy of the Indian Muslims itself is a subject of debate but I don't think that's what we are going to discuss today. But what I'm saying is that there is a, a lie widely told in Pakistan and as well as in India that uh, Jinnah was against the Khilafat movement and it is Gandhi who brought the ulama into politics. The truth is that in 1909 Jinnah was a member of the delegation of the Muslim League which went to England to plead the cause of the Khilafat. But the British just dismissed them because they had won the war and they wanted the oil fields and every, you know, the Belfort Declaration had been made. There was going to be some sort of state for, you know, uh, the Zionist movement and so on. So all that was in the background. Then one incident, one incident that we have to uh, point out, once again blaming Gandhi is very wrong. The Indian people, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, everyone, especially the Punjabis, had wholeheartedly supported the British during the First World War. If you look at the donations people made, huge donations were made, and more than a million uh, people from Punjab actually joined the army. So everybody was expecting that after the war, the British will grant some sort of greater self rule. What the British did was just the opposite. They imposed the Rowley tax, which gave arbitrary powers to the British to arrest people on simply a suspicion that they are conspiring to overthrow the legally established British government in the subcontinent. The only incident of any consequence they had in mind was the other uh, movement which they had crushed very easily. That was the only case where people were trying to overthrow them. Or the Bhadran Mok in Bengal had thrown a few bombs at the English when the partition of Bengal was undertaken. But generally everybody understood that most Brit Indians had been loyal to the British. So the Rowlet attacks were a most gross unfair imposition. And Jinnah himself in the Imperial uh, uh, Assembly is on record saying, I mean, he says that, look, you guys force people like the Irish to take up arms against you because you are, you know, you treat your subjects like dirt. So Jinnah is on record there. So is Mahatma Gandhi. Everybody, Indian, Muslim, was against it. Out of it, then, the Khilafat movement is the popular movement which is anti-colonial, which is anti-British in which everybody, Hindu, Muslim, then the rest were uh, part of it. <coughs> Gandhiji then gives this call for civil disobedience and Jinnah at no stage in his political career was willing to go out in the street and, and campaign against the British. His speeches critical of British policy are all in the assembly. He would not come out and face the consequences of ending up in jail or, or uh, in any uncomfortable uncom position. So that's the difference. Gandhiji, by the way, was sent to jail for six years because of this. A Muslim cause that he had adopted, and for six years he was sent to jail. I think he got some reprieve after a year and a half and so. So that was the first time he was in jail. But then at the 1920 Congress, uh, meeting, Jinnah takes his young wife there and he gets up and speaks in English once again and says, Mr. Gandhi and Mr. Muhammad Ali. 
and their followers, you know, heckle him again, saying, "You should say Mahatma Gandhi, and you say Maulana Muhammad Ali Jawahar." And he walks out with his wife, never to return to the Congress. So obviously, I'm saying now, if Jinnah was a charismatic leader who believed that he is the one who was leading Indians towards freedom or whatever, and the high point was the was the Lucknow Pact. Who was the man who came and stole the leadership from him? Mahatma Gandhi. And so once you have left Congress and you are no longer leading the main freedom struggle, the only choice you then have is to become the leader of the minority community to which you belong. And from 1920 to 1937, let's say, Jinnah was struggling all the time to assert his leadership with competing Muslim leaders. There was Aga Khan. There was Sir Fazli Hussain from Punjab. There was Sir Mia Mohammad Shafi from Punjab. Sir Abdul Rahim from Bengal, and some people even in the UP. You know, they were leaders of their own stature, including Chaudhary Khalifa Saman. So that period we can sh very quickly go over review, and that is when he is trying to argue. You know, while being the architect of the Lucknow Pact. His position is that we are all Indians, and in a free India, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, everybody will have equal rights. Now, having left the Congress, he says there is no Indian nation, but there are many nationalities, and among the nationalities, he counts Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Dalits, and Dravidians, and he says that for such an India, uh, any type of unity must be a very loose unity. With the center taking care only of, let's say, foreign affairs, defense, and maybe other essential subjects. The rest should be vested in the provinces. So that was the position he took. Whereas the freedom movement by that time has been radicalized to go beyond just self-rule. But the compromise position which was taken was the it was the Nehru report under the leadership of. Kotila Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru's father. By the way, Jinnah was invited to join it. He boycotted and went to England. So he didn't <coughs> join this committee. It was a committee in which all political parties in India were invited, including, you know, the Communist Party of various types were invited. The ethnic parties, Maharashtrian parties, Gujarati parties. Muslim parties of all sorts, Jumia, Tulma, Hind, and you name them, and all, everybody was invited. But the Muslim League uh, under Jinnah uh, boycotted it, but two Muslim leaguers did attend the meeting. One was Muhammad Shweb, and the other was Ali Imam. And the Lucknow Pact, they, sorry, the Nehru Report which came out, out of this national deliberation over a long period of time, I have argued in this book, Jinnah's uh, his successes, failures, and role in history, was an excellent way to balance regional uh, rights with a strong center. Now imagine, I don't think any state, especially of the stature and the magnitude and the complexities of India can run for a minute if there is not an effective central government. So, uh, in the Nehru report, it was laid down that there will be a religion and state would be separate. Men and women will have equal rights. The national language of India will be Hindustani with two official scripts, Devnagari and Urdu Persian. And all the provinces will have their own languages in which to conduct their affairs. They also said that separate electorates and so were inimical to the unity of India because if you because in 1919 when it came to Punjab to balance the Muslim majority, the British had given the six uh, separate electorates. So this is the way the English were playing one group against another. So the Nehru report says we go for universal adult franchise. Once you have that, then you don't need 
be it end of any sort, and the Muslims can claim the same number of seats as is the percentage of their population in the whole of India as well as in the different provinces. And I think this was a very fair, very workable, very practical formula which Jena refused to take part in. He came up with his 14 points and the 14 points were that you accept separate electives and uh, weightage for Muslims and so on and so forth. Now, at about this point, the freedom struggle had been radicalized further. In 1929, the Indian National Congress met in Lahore, my hometown, and from just self-rule, which was envisaged in the, in the Nehru report, now the demand is for complete independence. So the demand for the complete independence of India actually took place in Lahore in December 1929. What happened subsequently? A year later, or a little less, Alama Iqbal is invited to Allahabad, where he gives this call for the creation of a Muslim state in North Western. And one can wonder, why should this happen? Why should Iqbal go all the way to Allahabad and demand something which is what the nationalist movement was demanding? Because let me point out that when the Nehru report was introduced, was published, the jamiyat e ulma hind which is the biggest Islamic party, refused to support it on grounds that they were not demanding full independence for India. Mm. So to say that the Muslims were always collaborators with the British is, is just evil propaganda. They were more radical at that point. By 1929, the Jumiyat Ulumai Hind came back and they joined the freedom movement which was going on. Uh, in June 1929, I have quoted a letter of Jinnah Sahab to Prime Minister Ramsey MacDonald saying that my advice to you is to grant India dominion status. Because if you don't, the Congress is demanding independence and the people of India are with him. Jinnah is on record admitting that the people of India were behind the mm -hmm. demand for independence. But my argument is that the British, even in 1945, had no idea mm -hmm. of leading, leaving India. Mm -hmm. I'll come to that as we move further. So while Gandhi, Nehru, Jinnah and radical Muslims wanted a free India, and Jinnah wanted India to become a dominion status, the British had no acceptance for either views. They were steadfast in their decision to hold on to it. Unless you keep this in mind, mm -hmm. you don't understand how the political map or the, you know, the balance of power was changing. In 1935, finally, the British introduced the 1935 Act, which, you know, up until now, only about 2 to 3 percent of the population had the right to vote. And the right to vote was qualified by uh, how much property you owned and paid revenue and education. And very few people had such amount of property and education, even less. But in 1935, they expanded it, but only to give about 10, 11 percent of the Indian population the right to vote. So it was still 90 percent who were not enfranchised. That's finally when the <coughs> British left India, all voting, all elections are based on the 10 percent, 11 percent electorate. This we have to keep in mind as well. And they call provincial elections, and in the elections, I've said that both Congress and Muslim League had very similar manifestos. The Muslim emphasis is on Muslim rights, a weak center, and separate electorates. The Congress says that we will have a universal adult franchise, a strong center, an effective center, and substantial autonomy. Maybe I should have mentioned that already in the Nehru report, 37 subjects were given to the center, mm. 
and 67 were given, uh, 39 to the center and 67 subjects were given to the provinces. So I think there's a very good balance and you can't manage any state anywhere in the world which doesn't have an effective center. So the Nehru report was a very workable con uh, constitution if everybody had agreed, but Jinnah Saab had missed the chance, I'm saying. Had he stayed there, he could have even made a difference because he was a very persuasive man. But if you boycott, you know, certain opportunities, there is never a vacuum. Somebody comes and fills the vacuum. Anyhow, in the election, the Muslim League is...